recognize those individuals. But before that, Lord, I, I, I know the Lord wants us to, uh, you know, thank them for everything they have done for us. Uh, it's, a, it's a daunting task, you know, and, and this is just one way that we can offer our support and our show of appreciation for them in what they do. It's a thankless job. It really is at times. I remember I, I, I had a staff member at our school come to me, and she was all down and out because she just wasn't getting patted on the back enough. And I looked at her and I said, I can tell you something about education. I can tell you about when you're serving people. You need to get used to that because it isn't about getting patted on the back. But you know something as a congregation, sometimes we fail to do that for people, especially those who are serving us, who put all their time and effort into uh, making this place a place of prayer, making this place a place for us to come and get re restored and transformed. I love each of you. I want you to know that with all my heart. And I am so thankful that God has placed you in my life, my life, and in our lives. So with that said, we would love for you guys to uh, come forward, if you would. That's all staff, including, including the custodial staff, Jane and Ken, wherever you may be. I'd like for you to come forward as well. If you could just stand here in front of us, please. How about we give this uh, staff a warm Christian life? Thank you. In our yeah, that's right. How about we stand up for these guys? There, that's better. <laughs> Thank you. You guys may be seated then. Thank you. All right, we'd like to just say a few small things uh, about each of these individuals. Each of us have uh, been randomly selected to make a statement about each of you, so we'll start off with Cookie. I have Damaris. <laughs> Is, um, uh, if you all don't know, she's our church secretary, and I have a lot to say about her. So, with that being said, um, I don't know if you all know this, but before Damaris came, we had a secretary here for about a day. And to say that she was not, she was not the brightest crayon in the, in the box. She came in and she, uh, she ran out of typing paper. And she goes, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So she ran to Jane's office. Everybody runs to Jane, by the way. <laughs> and Jane says, now that's easy to fix. All you do is, take your, is, is go to the copier room and get some copy paper, and you're, you're, you're set. So this woman goes to her office, grabs the blank sheet of paper, runs back to the copy room, and puts the, cop, uh, puts the blank sheet of paper on the copier and made five blank copies. <laughs> that, my friend, is why we hired Damaris. <laughs> 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 
when, when we were looking for a secretary, Pastor Joe says, I want somebody that is going to be so computer savvy. She's going to know the inner works of a computer, and she's going to be able to put all these fantastic things together, and she's just going to be this, and she's just going to be that. Well, you know, I think he found it in her and more. If, if you notice out in the, in the foyer, all of the papers, the sign-up sheets for the different things that we have going on in our church, Damaris designed them and put them together for us. She also, uh, if you know, we had a chicken dinner recently and the little tickets that were printed up, Damaris did that. We are so glad that she is here, and I thank you so much, Damaris, for all your hard work. Thank you. It was a bit confusing, wasn't it? Um, I gotta say, I'm getting a kick out of looking at some of these pictures up here. Pastor Blake, you looked very ornery at a very young age. <laughs> Things hasn't changed. I have the privilege of speaking on uh, behalf of uh, our board and of those, uh, our congregation for Peter Guadalupe, Dr. Peter. <laughs> the first time I met him was in the boardroom. I was hanging doors in the board, Pastor Joe had Peter there and he had him come in and he shook my hand. And I, can I just say this? It just caught me, I, I felt his spirit right away. You know, if you ever want to know the relationship a man has with Christ, understand his heart. If you've ever heard Peter speak, not only in front of a crowd, but when he's off in a corner one-on-one -on -one with someone, his heart is revealed. And to me, that's a measure, a true measure of a man and his relationship with Christ. And I got to tell you, Peter, your heart is full of God's love. And we are so thankful to have you here as part of our staff as a visitation pastor. So thank you for coming on board. Thank you. All right, so I'm up here to honor Pastor Blake. And I guess I kind of know him. Some of our, our youth leaders have said that we have a bromance going. So, <laughs> so, so I guess like, like, like I said, like I, I, I've known him inside the church, outside the church. And I just want to say like, I don't know, it's to you that, that like, the, the, I guess to everybody, and the thank you to, like, 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 how you live your life, like, 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 I guess, like, you to sports terms off the court is the same as he lives on the court, so, like, like, Sundays is just him just, like, getting to say what he says in private in front of everybody else, and, and, like, the, the way he, the way he lives his life is, I feel like, he, he doesn't do stuff to do stuff, but he does stuff because it's in his nature, because his nature has been transformed by God, so, I, it's just, I, I just want to say that, like, for, for those of you who have, have kids that are in his youth group, like, like, they, like they're, t they, they're taken care of. Like, I don't know if you guys can see it or not, but, like, like, like one thing I say about Pastor Blake is he's great at taking the modern world and mixing it with, like, the Bible, but, like, he never sacrifices the Bible. Like, he still wants to have fun and, and still wants to do all this fun stuff. And, like, the, these kids are teenagers, and, like, they should be having fun. Like, they should be get their adrenaline rush, rushing and all this stuff and get some energy out. But he never sacrifices it for for the word of god like like there was a series we went through the book of romans and like a lot of pastors were like we can't go through the bible because the bible's so boring and the kids will get like get really bored but like pastor, pastor Blake's like i don't care at all because i'm like i'm getting the, i'm getting i'm getting the word across so yes pastor Blake, thank you for just being who you are and I just so uh, one more thing that pa pa pastor blake will cl clearly this is how you can tell pastor blake's not a religious person he's a spiritual he's a spiritual uh person with relationship with Jesus is that he says that he knows that like without Christ changing his life he'll be living a completely different life and he's very open and honest and if you ask him that that's that's what he'll say he'll be like yeah if God didn't save me I'd be doing this this and this and this so like that's just a testament of like how God has changed his life so so th thank you for everything uh, 
I'm not big on talking, but I was asked to talk about the people that do the dirty work of the church. Lots of times it's behind the scenes or fixing a sink that's running over or cleaning the toilets or sweeping the carpet. But I was asked to just say thank you to the custodial staff, Faye and Crawford and Darlene. And we just thank you and appreciate everything that's done. Matt said it's the cleanest church in Franklin County. All right, well, I'm talking about Pastor Bev. It's my pleasure. I mean, even made it in big font so I can read it without my glasses, but I didn't bring them just in case. Um, I want to thank Pastor Bev for her faithfulness to his children's ministry. I'm going to cry. Many of you don't know how many times she's wanted to quit. She's wanted to give up. But God always had a plan for her. And she's listened. And I just want to share a few fruits of her labor. She's had so many, but there's just a few that I have written down today. And I asked a young adult when he was wee little, I said, one thing that you've taken to your adulthood that you remember when you were in kids' church with Pastor Bev. He said, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, she taught me how to be fearless to the, in the Spirit by obedience. A teenager told me, she taught me I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that even though I don't have a good he earthly father, I have a heavenly father that loves me unconditionally. And then I thought to myself, Brenda, there's something Pastor Bev's taught you. Pastor Bev, you've taught me to speak with authority. There's times I get down, I get depressed. And you told me to speak to that devil. Tell him to flee in the name of Jesus. And she does that not to just one person, but she does it to all the kids that come through kids' church and every life that she touches. And Pastor Revette speaks volumes. You plant, you plant godly truth and values in every life that you touch. And from your staff... We think you're amazing, you're beautiful, and you're very passionate about your ministry. Continue to follow God's will, never give up, and listen to that soft, still voice. Thank you for everything that you do. Hi, I've been chosen to speak about Ken. But it was asked to keep it short, so <laughs> just kidding. <clears throat> well, no, I'm not kidding. Ken is great. Um, actually, Steve stole a lot of what I was going to say, but it's not unusual to have more than one person who's chasing after the heart of God. In fact, we should all be chasing after the heart of God. And what I've known seen from Ken in the time that I've known him is that he, he has God's spirit. And he, he sacrifices, he gives, and he, he doesn't stop. And it's only by the grace of God that he can keep going. And I, I have to say that, uh, that I love being around the man because he just exudes the love of Christ. And, you know, he's good with the computer and stuff too. But... <laughs> Mostly, it's, you know, his, he, he's just, he's, he's a family man. He loves his family. He loves his entire family, and that's all of us. And I, you know, I could stand up here and talk for hours. Um, I did want to say one other thing, that when this was being put together, uh, you notice that every beginning of every person that has their name, there's a scriptural verse there. And... Uh, I went into prayer 
for these. These weren't just pulled out of the air. These are what God's heart told me to put for these people. So <clears throat> when you look at them, look at the words, those words reflect those people and what they give and what they sacrifice for us. And we should be ever grateful that God has given us this great group of people. And they serve the God, we serve God, and we serve each other. Thanks, Ken. Well, good morning. I'm kind of like Matt. I love to worship the Lord and sing, but it put me on the spot. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> but I'm here to talk about Mrs. Jane Carlson and the special person that she is, not only to me, but I know to a lot of others out there as well. The first thing I can say about Jane is her passion for worshiping the Lord and her devotion every Sunday morning and making sure that the instrumentalist, instrumentalist and the vocalists that we're all working together as well as keeping us reminded of why we get up here every Sunday and do what we do. Jane not only devotes her time to leading worship, but she also serves in other areas as well. For example, the bookkeeper and um, she even helps on Wednesday nights with some teenage girls. Um, some of you may know this, some of you may not, but when Ken and Jane were youth leaders, they had my husband, Tim, in youth group. So I would always hear Tim say about these great people, yeah, like PK and Jane, they're just awesome. And so like I'm hearing this and hearing this that it's kind of funny because I felt like I began to like these people even though I didn't know them, <laughs> you know. Um, well, then the day came that I finally did meet Jane and Ken. And um, I know why you always talked about you guys. You guys are truly great people. So, Jane, thank you for your time, your obedience, your love for the Lord and others. And may the Lord bless you in so many ways. And I'd also like to share this verse because I think this describes you. But it's Philippians 2, 4, and it says, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others, and that's you. Thank you. There's always one kid on the block that has to do something different. But Pastor Joe, we love you. And I, for one, am always touched by your passion that you have for the Lord and your passion for us as board members, as church members. And I just want to say that I appreciate that very much. And I never have to wonder what Pastor Joe feels or thinks about me because I know and he's passionate, and he loves me, and he's like a father to me, even though I think I'm older than he is, but <laughs> anyway, here goes. Just a little fun thing for you. We wanted to give you this memento to make you smile. You are an extra special person. One night a month, your wife Debbie sends you off to a board meeting, but not before she gives you hugs and kisses. We sit around the table and go over mounds of whatchamacallit. And sometimes, sometimes we wish you would say, let's take five. You deserve a couple hundred grand every payday for putting up with this group of goobers. We love you, Pastor Joe, your nutty buddy board members. <laughs> Heads up. Now I took my head off, man. I'll save the, I'll hand out the bigger ones.
A little birdie told me that it was somebody's birthday today. It happens to be Brother Wiley. We are going to sing happy birthday to him, and we're going to present him with a gift from the church. So if you guys are ready, here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Brother Wiley. Happy birthday to you. And many more. Okay, the children can be uh, dismissed. Oh, they already were, were. That's good. Well, being that it's uh, Staff Appreciation Day, I know for a fact Pastor Joe is sitting there like twi twiddling his thumbs because he is a guy that has to be on the go all the time. He never stops, as some of the pictures showed up there. He looked like a uh, gangster there a couple of times, a basketball guy, and he kind of went through all the phases of life, if you will. But I know he's sitting there like, let me come up and preach. Too bad you're going to sit and listen today. So... It's my honor to introduce our guest speaker today. Um, the Shueys uh, have come to uh, speak to us today. Uh, John and Carrie Shuey just celebrated their 40th year anniversary last Sunday. Am I correct? How about we? <laughs> that's quite a feat, let me tell you. The Shueys have been serving the Lord since 1976 ish in various forms of ministries. To name a few, some of the organizations they work for was Child Evangelism Fellowship, Christian and Missionary Alliance Churches, Christ Community Church here in Camp Hill, and their most recent ministry with Kingdom Quest. They've served all over the world, places like Europe, Africa, Asia, and Central America. And last but not least, they've authored two books together, and John authored a book on his own. They are manuals, and it says display copy only, but they will be on display in the back. One is Becoming You, How to Discover and Fulfill Your God-Ordained Destiny, and the other is Breaking Free to Your Destiny. And John's most recent book, am I correct, is Fully Alive, Living the Life God Created You to Live. So as you can tell, these guys have been called to ministry and they've not let up on the accelerator. So we are thankful to have them here and we'd like to have a nice warm welcome for John Shuey. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, we've been here on a few occasions with uh, Lee and Mary McCullough, and uh, I don't know what kind of advertisement it was, is that uh, they literally left the state the week before I was going to be here to preach, so uh, uh, you, give me a chance, don't just go by that, and, uh, but we are glad to be here. We've enjoyed the opportunities that we've had to be here when, when we spent the weekend with Lee and Mary. We've appreciated the worship, your friendliness, the warmth. Uh, we always appreciate Pastor Joe's sermons. And if you really want to get up here and preach today, you know, I'm not going to fight you. It's your place. Um, and uh, not only do we appreciate the sermons, but we appreciate his heart. His heart for people, his heart to see something happen uh, in the Chambersburg area. Uh, always thinking of what God may want to do. And uh, I am glad that a lot of churches in October set time aside to appreciate their pastors and their staff. And it's our privilege to be here uh, during your celebration. And uh, we enjoyed hearing the uh, various things that you had to, to say. And I'm sure there could have been much more. And hopefully others of you will take opportunity all the time so, uh, to share, you appreciate them so that they won't have to get used to not being appreciated. And, uh, but that's 
part of the thing that happens. Well, we set various days aside to express our appreciation to people. And um, one of them, uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day, birthdays, uh, Grandmother's Day, whatever new day Hallmark comes up with to be able to sell cards, days to show appreciation. And everybody enjoys uh, their day. But I think every mom and every dad would tell you that as much as they enjoy Mother's Day or Father's Day and getting those phone calls if the kids uh, don't happen to be living at home anymore, what they really, really appreciate is being appreciated 24-7, 365. And so today, I want to share some things that will be helpful to you to expressing appreciation to your staff 24-7, 365, because that's what it's all about. And so uh, I'll share some things with you. But I, I want to begin with um, kind of an overall. If we're really going to understand ministry, we need to understand what is the overarching thing that Jesus has asked his church with the capital C, his church worldwide, to do. And uh, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, your good assemblies of God people, I'm sure that you probably have this verse memorized, and I could ask you to come up here. Uh, it's when Jesus is getting ready to leave, and he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I spent most of my years in ministry with the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And uh, the Assemblies of God and the Christian and Missionary Alliance actually have some similar roots uh, to them. And at mission conference, you hear that verse. But I know sometimes what happens is when we hear something over and over and over again, we don't hear it anymore. It's just like, oh, I know that. I know that. That kind of thing happens. When I first became a believer, I would go to bed at night praying the same prayer. And one night I fell asleep in the middle, and I woke up a few minutes later and just continued where I went. And I said, this is probably not the way I need to be praying. Uh, but, but that can happen with Scripture. So just as a reminder, uh, this Scripture, and it's what Jesus wants the church to be about, and so if we're going to look at the role of an individual church, we need to understand that, is that we're to be making disciples, genuine followers of Jesus. The first church that uh, Carrie and I were in leadership in, uh, they kind of called everybody a disciple that one day went to the altar and prayed the, you know, a sinner's prayer. Uh, but a disciple is a follower of Jesus, and that means someone that does, does what he asked them to do. We're to be making them in all nations. And uh, the word there is, the Greek word is ethnos, it means ethnic groups. There are literally 17,000 ethnic groups in the world with those who study that. And Jesus someday wants somebody from every one of them to be around this throne because he deserves to be worshipped by every culture and every language. Uh, we have all these ideas about heaven. I sometimes think in heaven people are going to have their own languages. We're just going to all understand them. And all those languages and styles of worship are going to go up together in this amazing crescendo that's going to sound awesome. Your worship today was awesome. It was, it, was just, it was just great. There was a time there when I just thought the roof was going to come off and God was working. But as good as that was, it's nothing compared to what it's going to be when the nations are around there. And of those 17,000 ethnic groups, missiologists tell us that there's about 6,500 of them that do not have a church strong enough, a witness strong enough, where people can hear about the gospel. And Jesus wants us to be involved in that. We have a a friend who used to attend Assemblies of God Church, and he gets the missions magazine, and so whenever there's anything on Pakistan or India, he always comes and brings them to us after he reads them. And I just recently read that the Assemblies of God has the goal, you probably read this too, to have 500 church planters go into the Himalaya regions where there are 2,000 of the 6,500 unreached people groups that are there, and they've developed this incredible strategy 
uh, to reach out to them. And that's, you know, Assemblies of God is amazing in that way and seeking to strategize and go out so that all of us in the church, Big C, are to be involved in that process. So for you, it's making disciples in Chambersburg and the surrounding area and however God would have you to do, but it's also to participate in the job of reaching those unreached people groups around the world so that someday, someday, the scriptures tell us that when the gospel of the kingdom is preached throughout all the earth, every ethnic group hears he's going to come. So we sang that song, Come Lord Jesus. If you want him to come, get out there. Get the job done. Let's not just go for 2,000 of those people groups. Let's go for 6,500 and see them come. That's the big picture. Okay, so the, the next picture then is, okay, what happens here? How do we appreciate the staff? And I think we can go to that next one. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll just hold on there. Uh, we're going to talk about the pastors. It should have the word staff in there. They're 24, and if you've ever watched the place 24, you know they just never stop. Uh, Jack Bauer just never stopped, and how he got all that done in 24 hours, I will never know. But uh, he managed to do that, and we want to, we want to talk about, uh, and, and I know more, I pastored for 29 years, and we've been doing this for 11 years now, so I know more about the senior pastor's role and maybe a staff pastor's role than some of the others. But I want you to know that one of the things that's important for you to do for some reasons that I'll talk about is you need to know what your staff does. What is their job? What have they been tasked to do? And I think you can just click the button one more time. Something else should come up there. What, what is their job? Well, find that out. But for, for Pastor Joe particularly, but your leaders, your staff, one of the things is to develop vision. It's to develop vision. And that task is primarily the job of the lead pastor. Uh, there may be some consulting that goes on, but if you've got three or four people developing a vision, you will have division because more than one person with a different idea. And it may, doesn't it make sense that if God's going to lay out his vision for the church, he's going to talk to the person that he's placed as pastor. That just, that just makes sense. But what the vision is, is you take big C, reaching, making disciples of the nations, and, okay, what is the role of this congregation in this particular place? What does that look like, and how will it come up? And, and I, and I want to mention this. It's very important because I've been around the church now for oh, probably 50, 55 years now, and I've been involved in ministry about 40 years. And one of the things that happens in churches and congregations is that people sometimes get upset because the church is not being run the way they think the church ought to be run. And, but God has given the vision and gives the vision to the senior pastor. And so that doesn't mean you can never go talk to your leadership. I hope you do. And I, I think I know Pastor Joe well enough to know that he would sit down and talk. But when you share your ideas, you lay them there and you walk away and you pray and ask God to give them wisdom to know exactly what to do. So number one is vision. And the other staff with the responsibilities they have, they may develop some vision for their aspects of the ministry, but always part of and feeding the overall vision of the church. The second thing is, and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, the second aspect of the job that I want to talk about, Ephesians chapter 4. This is a, a, a familiar portion of scripture, but a rather interesting one. Uh, in that it tells us much about the role of certain persons in the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, starting at verse 11, it says, It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And so these five particular uh, offices that we call them, 
and the pastor specifically being in here, and you've got a number of pastors in the church, that one of their things is to equip people for the work of the ministry. Now, I know the Assemblies does not do this, and I was with the Alliance for a lot of years, and then with Christ Community, and we didn't do this, but a lot of denominations and churches call their pastor the minister. And here's what that communicates. We give you a paycheck every week, and you do the ministry. Now, many churches don't use that term for their pastor, but sometimes people kind of anticipate that. We give you a paycheck every two weeks or a month or whatever it is, and we want you to do the work of the ministry. But scripturally, what these people do, what your leaders do, is their job is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. In fact, I probably could make a case based on this scripture that it's you that's to do the ministry and not the leadership, although what they do is ministry. And God will give unique ministries to every one of those people based upon the particular gifts that they have. And so that involves really three things. Uh, number one, creating an environment where people will come to Christ and become disciples. We want to be training people to be followers of Jesus. Not just pray the sinner's prayer, live your life the way you want to live your life, and someday you'll go to heaven. In fact, the matter is, I hope you agree with me that that's not the gospel that's in the Bible. The gospel that's in the Bible is you're a sinner and you're not right with God, and if you receive Christ into your life, you can get right with God, and we can't be right with God if he's not Lord. I mean, he's Lord. So we can't be, we can't be, the, uh, we can't be right with him if we're not doing that. So we want to produce disciples. And I want to say that, that that process for your leadership is overseeing that process. It doesn't mean that they do it all. In fact, during prayer time this morning, it was prayed that, that the place would be packed and there'd be standing room only. Well, I can guarantee you that one pe person or six people or seven people can't do these tasks on their own. But as people begin to become trained and begin to walk in their place of ministry, some of them will be the ones that will be equipping, and there will be oversight roles for the pastor and the staff. So, so helping people to discover where it is that their gifts lie, where their ministries lie, because every one of us, if we know Jesus, we've been given spiritual gifts. And spiritual gifts are supernatural abilities that enable us to participate in the process of making disciples of the nations. In and of ourself, we'd all be going down the same road Pastor Blake would have been going on himself to Messville. But uh, Jesus... When he gets a hold of us, he begins to make us different. He begins to infuse us, not only, not only with the Spirit himself, but the Spirit then gives us gifts so that we're uniquely qualified in order to engage in ministry, that we're uniquely qualified to do what God wants us to do in Chambersburg or wherever it is that we live in order to fulfill that. All of us, there are... There are no duds in the kingdom of God. Only born again, saved people, gifted by the Holy Spirit, with a call on their life that the scripture says is immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine. He wants to blow your mind. He doesn't want, just want people to give testimony as to what Pastor Bev has accomplished, but what every one of you has accomplished, and it's he, him that does it, we're, we're just, we're just kind of like vessels, we're like glasses that the water pours out, and the neat thing about the Holy Spirit is, is the more you pour out, the more he pours in, and so your staff and your leadership oversee a process that enables you to become all that God wants you to be. And then thirdly, to establish you in those ministries. For many of you, that means you'll take up roles here in the church. And sadly, for leadership that loves you, sometimes it means sending them off 
to faraway places or places that are 50 miles away, but you're not going to see them very much as they're called to uh, what could be to do whatever it is. God may call you to be an engineer and you need to move to San Diego, but what he really wants you there in San Diego for is some aspect of ministry. But that always hurts, especially when someone has invested so much of their life in you. But that's some of the rule and some of the understanding of the rule. And it's, it's important for us in appreciating what the staff does is to understand what is it they're, they're supposed to do. Now, one of the things that will happen is that every one of your staff members will do their job a little bit differently than somebody else would do their job. They've got differing gifts. The last CMA church that I was in, when I went there, half of the people in the congregation thought that if the word, if the word pastor appeared in the dictionary, the previous pastor's picture would be right there. Half of the people weren't so sure that that would be the case. And so when I went there, the assumption was is that I would have all of the gifts that he had and all of the gifts that he didn't. Well, guess what? I didn't have a lot of the gifts that he had. I had other gifts. Did the same job in a different way, but both of us were charged with the same responsibility. And then every pastor will have some of those little extra gifts that go along that enable them to minister in a, in a variety of ways. Well, what are some of the challenges that they face? Uh, they, it's already been mentioned that sometimes it's a thankless job that, uh, that pastors have. And, and uh, I, you know, keep those cards and letters coming. Send emails, send texts. Back when I was pastoring, I, we were just getting into email. I know some of you are young enough, can't, you, you didn't have email, you didn't have text messaging. We actually, you know, the, in those museums, you see those pay phones? <laughs> we actually saw some pay phones in Lancaster this week, but I think it was like for the Amish to use for their business because, no, you know, the only people that use those anymore are drug dealers, and for the most part, they use burner phones. So they don't, they don't need to use those anymore. We, we actually had people that used those occasionally back, uh, back in the day. But uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is talking about all the things that he went through. Shipwrecked, you know, being stranded at sea, uh, and he just kept on plowing along. But he said in verse 28, besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all of the churches. When someone is tasked with the responsibility in God... They carry on their shoulders those people. That is something that Pastor Joe carries for all of you and Debbie. And that is something that each of your other staff people, they carry for the people that are under them. And it's a real thing. I never realized what that was until I went from a church that at its height was 150. It wasn't that many when we left. And I went to be on staff at Christ Community that at the time probably was running 1,700 to 23 on a Sunday morning. So I was ministering to more people. When I preached, I was preaching, you know, what would have been 10 Sundays at my other place if you added them all together, uh, ministering to more people in the various ministries that I had. But I can tell you that even though I was ministering to more people, there was less of that load on me because I wasn't the one carrying the congregation, but somebody else was. And that responsibility is real. There's a burden when somebody's not doing well spiritually, when they're not doing well physically, when, when the, the church hasn't picked up the vision and, and, and they're running with it, there is this weight that they carry. And the, the family carries it together, but, the, you know, the wife begins to carry it because she sees what's going on with her husband or the husband because of what he sees going on with the wife. And that is one of the challenges. Any of you who've been parents, you know the weight that you sense for your kids and you want them to do well and you want them to become everything that God wants them to be. Well, just imagine that you're carrying this. 
And I know Pastor Joe's carrying more because obviously on any Sunday morning there are people who are not here, there are people who are connected. And so every one of your staff members experiences that. That's why they need you to pray for them. You remember when Joshua was down fighting the Amalekites in Exodus chapter 17, and uh, he's up on the mountain, and uh, as long as he kept his hands in the air to God, they'd won the victory. I, don't, I mean, I don't know, you know, probably worshipers would be able to do that longer because they're used to having their hands up. But, you know, you can hold your hands up for just so long. And, it, you know, it takes a little bit more time than it takes to do worship uh, to win a battle. And so there were those that came alongside of, and they held their hands up. And anything that you can do to help lighten that load uh, would be appreciated because it's one of the challenges. The second challenge is the area of spiritual warfare. Zechariah 13.7 says this. It says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And I know in the New Testament that that scripture is quoted uh, when Jesus was taken and everybody but, uh, you know, the disciples all scattered except for Peter and, you know, he did his thing uh, as he got closer and closer and began to become challenged. But that's a broader principle that's applied in that particular situation. If the enemy can take down your leadership, in many ways he's going to take down many of you. It's, it's just the way things operate and the way things happen. And so there's a spiritual warfare that comes that uh, can't be imagined. I, I, know, I know from many years of preaching, there's no explanation for the exhaustion that you have when you're finished preaching, except for the fact that there's this spiritual dynamic going on. Now, thankfully... God and the devil are not yin and yang, where there's these two equal forces of good and bad fighting for each other, and we wonder which one's going to win. We know which one's going to win. We know which one already won. We know which one's doing mop-up work right now to bring to reality what he's done, but that doesn't mean that the spiritual warfare is not real. And the spiritual warfare comes in a couple of levels. Sometimes it comes in the area of distractions. There can be a lot of distractions that can come into the staff's lives, into the pastor's lives, that keep them from doing what it is that they're supposed to be doing. Sometimes it has to do with congregational expectations that aren't really in the God-given job description. Sometimes it does. We all have expectations of people. And one of the things that I've learned, I'm getting old enough now that I've learned a few things, uh, still need to learn a whole lot more, is that one of the best things that we can do sometimes is just to lower our expectations. Now, that doesn't mean I, you're not going to expect Pastor Joe to do a good job, because I know that he will. But we have expectations. Then the last church, the pastor did this, the staff did this, our youth pastor did this, or the last one that we had in those, they did this and they did that and they did the other thing. Well, they're not the one God has here right now. The one you have is the one that's here right now. And, and as, as they're doing what it is that God wants them to do, it may look different than you think, but God's going to accomplish what he wanted. And if he wanted the other person here, they'd still be here. God can change his kids around anywhere that he wants them to go, and so there's distractions. There can be direct attacks on your leader's families, on them spiritually, uh, and they're very, very painful, but they can do that. And then there's the spiritual attack of the fact that God or the devil blinds the eyes of those that believe not, but sometimes we allow him to blind us as believers, and we just, we don't get it. And so there's this warfare working against. Now, thankfully, We've got God, and thankfully we've got the Holy Spirit, but those challenges exist. And then the third one that I have here, there's one more job. Uh, well, it's really a delight, and that is that the staff, the pastors and the staff need to walk in intimacy with God. In John 15, Jesus says, apart from me that you can do nothing. He said, he, he said, the branches will not produce fruit unless they're connected to the vine. 
And sometimes the load is so large that there can be a temptation to want to get the job done, but not spend the time in the prayer. And I know Pastor Joe's a man of prayer. You're blessed to have a man of prayer. I know that others of your staff are people of prayer, and they're going to be learning that from him. It's extremely, extremely important that they be people of prayer. And, and here's what I want to say to you as a congregation. Give them space to do that. Give them space to spend time. If the, if the pastor comes or the staff comes and just says, look, I just need a few days to go seek God, that's not a bad thing. They're not trying to escape. They're saying, I want to get a hold of God. I want to hear what he wants to say. I want to know what the next step is to be. Or I want to have more power on my life. There is nobody that was better prepared to go out and evangelize than the 12. Or the 11 after Judas. I mean, they'd been with Jesus for at least a year and a half being discipled, day by day. They saw him crucified. They saw him alive. They saw him go up into heavens on a cloud. I mean, you'd think at the top of that thing, Jesus would have said, charge! I mean, there's nobody more prepared. And he said, wait. And so they prayed for 10 days. How many people could they have evangelized in 10 days? But when the Holy Spirit came after that time of prayer, 3,000 people after one sermon. And Peter didn't even have to give the altar call. The people that were preached to gave the altar call. Wait, Pastor Joe, wouldn't you love to preach some morning and the people cry out, Pastor, what do we do? Wow. What would that be? And so that time is needed. Give it. Encourage it. Send your staff off at times with their spouses to get training, to, to, to just spend time alone with the Lord because uh, it is just amazing what God does when we look at him. And Jesus spent 40 days in fasting preparing for his ministry. He prayed when things were busy. He prayed when he was exhausted. He prayed all the time. He prayed before he chose the disciples uh, leaders need to be people of prayer. Okay, that tells you a little bit about what your staff does. So now here's your part. Here's your part. And some of you might be saying, John, wow, you're uptight. Wow, you're serious. I'm going to tell you, the day after my 40th anniversary, I had my 69th birthday. Same age as my grandchildren. One is six and one is nine. I'm 69. We're the... That'll never happen again, you know. Um, and I'm thinking, at best, unless I'm like your brother here who just celebrated, what was it, 93, 94 years? That's wonderful. I've probably lived at least 75% of my life. In fact, none of us knows whether we have tomorrow. But if we go the average, I've probably lived about 75% of my life. I want the rest of it to count. And I trust if you're seven, or you're 93, that you want the rest of what it is that you have of this life to count to make a difference for advancing the kingdom. So, now's your part. We can just pop the first one up there. The first one's already there. Second one, understanding the leader's role. We've talked about that. Second of all is give your life fully to God's purposes. You don't know how your staff will feel appreciated if you do that. It's so much easier to lead sheep that want to follow. And if the shepherds are leading us in the direction that God wants us to, if we want to follow Jesus, we're going to follow. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, after Paul goes through this incredible teaching on our salvation... And he says, I urge you now to give your life a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable in God, which is your reasonable service of worship. In light of everything he's done for us, the most reasonable thing for us to do is to give him our whole life. 
when Abraham took Isaac up on the mountain to sacrifice him. I can't imagine the difficulty of that thing. And when the angel stopped him, he said, Now we know you fear God because you have not withheld your only son. And that word withheld means not to put restraints on, not to put restrictions on. God wants us to come to the point where we don't put restraints on him. We don't put restrictions on him. We're saying, Lord, here I am. I don't have any line in the sand. Whatever you want to do in my life, through my life, to my life, wherever you want me to live, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do. If you become a congregation full of people like that, this place will fill up. And Jesus will become more famous in your region. And that's what we want. Second of all, Do everything that you can to determine what your spiritual gifts are if you don't already know and what your calling is. If you're saying, I have no clue, well, try things. When there's a note in the bullet and an announcement made that we need somebody to do something and you have no idea what God wants you to do, it's not going to hurt you to try. You might even like it. And when you discover what your gifts are, it's going to be something that you're going to enjoy you know, God's not going to say, you know what, I'm going to call so-and-so to do this, and they're going to be miserable the rest of their life, but, they're, but I'm going to use them. No, I'm going to love it. I, I can't think of anything I like to do more than preach or teach the Word. But you heard a few people up here today to say, no, nah, man, I don't like being up in front of people, but I know that you all can do things that I wouldn't like to do and I would be terrible at. We all work it together. And then thirdly, part of that commitment is, if you're part of the congregation, and if you're part of a ministry, submit yourself to your staff. And we're saying, ooh, ouch. That one hurts. But if you're going to follow the leaders, you need to follow the leaders. Sometimes people say, it sounds so spiritual. I don't listen to anybody but God. I'm sorry about that, but God set leaders up. And so if you're not listening to your leaders, you're not listening to God. Just chew on that one at lunch today. So, so make yourself available to allow God to use your gifts to accomplish the purposes that are there. And then the next one, please. Fervently pray for your staff, each other, and your leaders. I've just recently been studying some of the patriarchs. It's really been enlightening. And and uh, this guy, Jacob, what a wretch. I mean, he cheated his brother out of his birthright. He cheated him out of his blessing from, his, from God. He goes to Laban. Laban cheats him out of the first wife, lets him have the second wife, and then he, God blesses him, and so he's got to flee from Laban. And so here's Jacob. He's got to get away from Laban, and God says, I want you to go back to Canaan. And he knew that was what God wanted to do, but waiting for him was his brother Esau, whom he cheated out of everything. So Jacob, who always figured things out on his own, lines his family up in four nodules. I mean, the, the, the wife he liked the least, and her kids were first and second, and then Leah, then Rachel, figuring that if, you know, if you know, the bloodbath happens, maybe Rachel and her two kids would still be left, and he's just trying to figure this all out. He sent people ahead to take out gifts and all that, and they came back and they said, Esau is coming to meet you with 400 men. I'm guessing it wasn't because he wanted to have a parade. And all of a sudden, an angel comes and wrestles with him. And later on, Jacob believes it's God because he said, I saw God and lived. And so they're having this wrestling match. Now, that you know, the angel wasn't ex you know, using much energy because I think most angels could take most of us in a wrestling match. I mean, that would be no problem. And the angel says, let me go. And Jacob says, I am not going to let you go until you bless me. Here was a desperate man, death on one side, death on the other side, wondering what's going to happen to his family. And all of a sudden he recognizes, I'm not going to figure this out. I'm not going to cheat my way out of this one. God, I need you. 
and all around us, in our region, in our state, young people are dying of heroin overdoses. Families are falling apart and kids are being destroyed in that whole process. As was mentioned before, we live in a world where sin is flaunted and desired. We live in that kind of a society. We have 6,500 people groups that couldn't come to a place like this or even a hidden place because there's no gospel witness in their language, in their ethnicity. We, uh, we have had, what, four hurricanes now that have hit U.S. territory in devastating ways. We've had the Las Vegas killings. We've had the earthquakes in Mexico. And we've got North Korea. We've got Iran. We've got ISIS. We've got all of these things going on. If we don't recognize that we're living in desperate times, we never will. And every day, I think the number is about 175,000 people, maybe it's a, an hour, die and most of them go into a Christless eternity. We're living in desperate times. We're living in times when, oh God, please bless Pastor Bev and her family. That's nice. It's not going to cut it. It's going to be God. Those children need an encounter with Jesus. And so when Pastor Bev and her staff minister to them, may the Holy Spirit come down. Might they be saved? Might they be filled with the Holy Spirit? Might they give themselves? We need to get desperate in our prayers. Lord, there's this burden on Pastor Joe. We know it is. We want to pray and lift it up. We want to be Aaron and her lifting up their arms, making it possible for them to do. We need to become people of fervent prayer. What we're doing isn't cutting it. During prayer time this morning, at the beginning, we heard a prophetic word that came from a dream. Church, wake up! Church, wake up. The Lord is asking for the church, not just this church, but the church. Let's wake up! Let's realize the times that are around us and let's realize unless we get on our faces before God, unless we get serious about giving our lives to God, unless everything is given to him with no restrictions, we're not going to win this thing. And we know Jesus already said he won, so something's going to happen to us. We need to do that. And then I think there's one more slide up there. And this is a suggestion for the staff, and you may already do this. Uh, a number of years ago, I was out at a park praying, and I felt like God said to me, you need to get a team of people specifically recruited to pray for you. Things got a little bit better in the church, and I forgot about what God said to me. And a few months later, we got a call from one night, I think it was from the wife of a pastor friend, and the next night it was from his daughter. And, um, but the day before that happened, I was on a sabbatical. I was visiting a church of a friend of mine, and, and there was a small group of people meeting there on a Sunday night. And I saw him later that week, and he said, there, I asked the gal to pray for you, and she woke up in the middle of the night. And she said, there's a group of pastors on the West Shore that don't have enough of prayer. And she said, John, and that pastor that he mentioned, they're sick, are two of them. Well, by the time the pastor told me that, I'd already seen my pastor friend was having a nervous breakdown. I had to take him to a, a Christian mental health facility to get some help. And so the rest of my sabbatical, I read books on recruiting a prayer team and uh, wanting to do that because God got my attention. And so I, and, and some people say, well, we can't just recruit certain people to pray. Why we recruit certain people to work in the children's department, the worship department, and whatever? Why not specific ones? Now, does that mean the rest of you can't pray for them? I, I trust you are. Some of the people that we recruit to pray for us, especially as pastors, may need to be people outside the church that we can really open up and share with and uh, some things. And unless you're a pastor, you don't quite understand that one, but it's a reality that, that can happen. But uh, So anyhow, my friend gets out, of his, uh, gets out of this place and goes back to pastor, and I gave him two of the books that I had read, and he read them, and he recruited these eight guys to be on his team. And uh, they began to pray for him. They were like soldiers wanting to pray for him. 
And one day during testimony time, someone got up and gave a testimony that was very negative to the leadership and the pastor of that church. And these eight guys stood up in the back of their pews and they walked up and they stood behind the pastor as he dealt with it, indicating, we got his back. We're with him. But the amazing thing is, here's someone who had a nervous breakdown. Within a year, he came to me and he said, John, what do you think about the idea of my family and I moving to Alaska to become missionaries to the natives there? And I just started to laugh. I started to laugh not because I thought it was the most ridiculous idea I'd ever heard. Is the job that he was going to do, I can't think of anybody. He was going to be like a professor at this thing, and he was, he was just like, a professor. I mean, he was. It was the perfect thing. But from a nervous breakdown to a prayer team to taking the risk of moving your family 4,000 miles to go into a culture that you'd never been in before, well, how do you explain that? It's prayer. And so my encouragement uh, to you is, based on my experience, you may all do it, make sure that you have three, four, five, six, or depending on the level of your leadership more, people that that have agreed to pray for you multiple times a week, if not every day, and then keep them informed. I used to do these little newsletters and send them out, but now you've got text messages and, and all kind of things that you can let people know uh, what your requests are. And that doesn't mean that requests don't come out in the bulletin and those kind of places. But if we do these kinds of things, we give, give our life to the Lord. We fervently pray for the ministry of the Lord. If, if we, and out of an understanding of what the job is, they're going to feel appreciated 24-7, 365. Yeah, pray before, yeah, my wife is telling me, she said, pray before you ask people to do it. We made a whole list of people, and I had someone on the list I wanted to ask, and Carrie said, mm, I don't think so. And I said, but they're an elder. How can I not ask him? Well, he was offended that I asked him to pray for him, me because he thought I was saying he wasn't praying, and it, she was right. So it, if those of you that are married, listen to your spouse. I usually say, guys, listen to your wife, but in some of these cases, the other way around, it's the, it's the lady who's on the staff. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to ask the staff if they would just come out here and spread out across the front of the auditorium as we come to a close. And your spouses can come with you because they may not have the official title, but they're involved in the ministry. And I'm going to ask others of you, if you desire to do this, and whenever I give a call for somebody to do something, I'm, all, I'm always happy if people are just honest. But... Uh, if, if you're saying, I want to pray for them like that, I really want to engage in prayer, I'm going to ask you just to come up and gather around them, and then I'll have a word of prayer at the end. And you may be coming and saying, I'm going to pray for all of them, and there may be some that you feel a special affinity to that you want to be engaged in praying for them. Father, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for the scene that's developing among us here. And we ask that this would be a description of what happens Monday through Saturday that people would be engaged in praying for their staff, that they would be engaged in loving their staff, that they would be engaged in supporting the staff so that they can lead the congregation to where you want them to go. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. We are officially dismissed, but you can stay and pray for as long as you would like to.